Here we go, going live. Tell me what to do to make all my Lunker Lake dreams come true. Hello, everybody. Bob Lust, the Pond Boss, coming at you live right here, Gordonville, Texas. World Headquarters of Pond Boss Magazine. Looks like the Saunders are checking in. A crawdad Daddy from South Louisiana, Christopher Aguilar, is checking in. Good to see you folks. Steve Lewis, he's in a little early tonight. I don't know what you're doing out inside the house there, Steve. Fisheries biologists don't come in this time of day. Jason Nepstad from North Carolina, somewhere over here. Well, heck, I ran off and left my hats and stuff. Anyway, hey, Pond Boss Magazine, look at this. This ain't the latest one. I'm running late today, folks. <laughs> yep, been on the road, just got back. Here we go. There's a new issue of Palm Boss right there. There it is. 35 bucks a year. Shane McIntyre, I'll see you up. Hey, got some good stuff in this issue of the magazine. But you guys, you guys know the drill. You guys have been watching this for a while. You know, uh, you uh, click like. Hashtag Palm Boss Magazine in the comments section so we can see that. And share this to your timeline. And you're eligible for a drawing for a Palm Boss hat. Which, I don't have one with me. Here I am in World Headquarters. And I don't have a hat. <laughs> well, that's what I get for being late. And a, um, a Pond Boss mug. Oh, don't have one of those either. <laughs> Knows how to keep hot things hot, cold things cold. We got a winner this week. Jay Spires. Jay, you won the drawing. Leanne drew your name about 20 minutes ago during one of our meetings. And uh, you, uh, you're you going to be getting a, a hat and a mug. Well, tonight I thought we would talk about more about going in depth. I don't know what the girls topped up, but we're going to be talking about um, we're going to be talking more about how to raise trophy fish, and that's actually a topic that I'm going to hit in the next issue of Palm Boss Magazine. Dave Beasley wrote an article about raising trophy fish in small waters and what it takes, and we're going to have that. Let me see here. I'm going to need to find where we are so I can see your question. Let's see a lot of people checking in. Michael Eric, Travis Paul Smith checking in. Holy cow, bear with me a minute, guys. Anthony Abate, I see you up there, buddy. I haven't seen you in a while. I need to find the page here so I can read all these things coming in. Oh, oh there it is. There it is. Here it comes. I'm almost there. Got to be sure the sound is off. I'll be talking over myself. There we go. All right, now I can see what's going on. Holy cow, there's a lot of guys checking in already. We already got 50 people up there, 49 people. Jason Nibstad, John Funk from Mid-Michigan, Frank James checking in from Louisiana, Mike Cottrell, our good buddy from Texas, Billy Bates, John Funk got rain today, Danny Mack, Danny Mack's checking in from San Antonio, Jack Hamilton from Indiana, Zach Cook, he's got the drill going on. Good to see Shane McIntyre, Ken Dowd, York Springs, Pennsylvania, we got folks from all over. Hey, there's Dave Weber. Dave Weber got time to check in from Northeast Kansas. He's up there a little north of Kansas City. Good to see you, brother. Let's see here. Michael Eric got that last issue all read. Pretty good articles in there. We got some really good writers. The thing I love about Palm Boss writers is they're not writers. They go out and do it, and then they tell the story. You know, so we've got, you know, Mike Otto, who... Uh, He's on a bulldozer or a track hoe, you know, digging dirt, pushing dirt, managing employees. He got an article every issue. Michael Gray, same thing. He's over in Tennessee. He'll be checking in tonight, I got a feeling. You know, and so, uh, you know, um, the fish professor, Mark Cornwell, He's he teaches young fish students with mushy brains about all about growing big fish and how the upstate New York fisheries works. You know, we got guys from all over the nation that do a really good job. Let's see here. Uh, let me see what's going on here. Travis, good afternoon. Let's see. Steve Lewis. You know, I, I want to brag about Steve. I've known Steve probably, I bet you, Steve, you and I have known each other 30 years. And Steve has always been that grassroots, pond mud under the toenails, fisheries biologist that's in the trenches growing fish. He worked for the state of Arkansas, recently retired. Uh, and he's got his own small fish hatchery where he grows pure strain Florida bass in Hot Springs, Arkansas. Just glad to call him a friend. Frank James says, Bob, we suddenly, we've had a relatively cool rainy summer so far. How does this affect largemouth groves? 
growth. Is it better than the scorching summer? Way better. Way, way, way better. You know, I gotta, I'll tell you a little story here. And this is going to apply to growing trophy fish. I promise. Um, when I was working, in, I, I worked on a very cool project in upstate New York back in 2004 and 2005. And I knew nothing about northern waters. I'd heard about walleye. I'd seen a few smallmouth bass. Tiger muskie? What was that? What's a tiger trout? Brook trout? Those don't grow in Texas, you know. And at that point, pretty much most of my career had been centered around Texas, Arkansas, Louisiana, uh, Oklahoma, and maybe a little bit into Missouri, not much. But uh, when that happened, I was charged with improving the experience of guests coming to this private resort and improving the fishery. Well, I got to thinking, man, the last guy they hired, they fired after 60 days, and he was the recently retired uh, chief of inland fisheries for the entire state of New York. You know, well, if they fired a guy from New York that knows about New York, what in the world are they bringing me from Texas up there for? <clears throat> so I knew that I needed to figure out something he didn't and do it. So what I did, first thing, was I, I tried to find every fisheries biologist, every fisheries professor, every fish hatchery owner and manager that I could find. And I brought them in for a meeting at this resort destination and fed them lunch. And I said, okay, here's the deal. I want to know why why you can't grow 10-pound bass in New York. Every one of them agreed it couldn't be done. Every every single one of them. So I said, okay, that's going to be that's gonna be the box we're going to get into. So they really drilled down into three things. The growing season is too short. They can't have Florida genetics. And they couldn't produce enough food. Bluegills spawn later than bass. They only had like 75 days worth of bluegill growth. So I started thinking, okay, well, we can we can kind of beat that food chain thing because on this re on this um, private preserve, hunting and fishing resort slash preserve, there were all kinds of small hatchery ponds. So I knew we could raise a bunch of fathead minnows and suckers and bluegills and red ears. But what I didn't realize, and I, it kind of brought it into scope, focus for me, was I knew that it took 10 pounds of bait fish to produce one pound of bass. And what I didn't really know was what does it take to maintain that pound while they're gaining the next pound. So I knew it was gonna take a lot of bait fish to do that. Well, as I got to thinking about it, you know, bluegill didn't spawn there until June, and then the water starts getting cool in September. So we had about a 75 day window for bluegills, but in Texas, you know, in Point South, we have 300 to 340 bluegill growing days because it's hot. Bluegill grow when it's hot. So as I thought about it some, and I said, well, tell me about the growing season for, for bass. Well, it starts about the end of May, middle of May maybe, and it ends in September. May, June, July, August, September. Hmm. So I said, you got maybe 140, 150 days? They said, yeah, yeah. Well, it didn't click with me until, and I've told this story several times, but I got to go to a wine tasting. I, 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 didn't, I, didn't know, I knew nothing about wine other than I was fascinated with the way they grow grapes the way they made the wine, I'm, you know, the science behind that and the art of winemaking, I'm, to this day, I'm fascinated with it. I like to drink it a little bit better now than I did then. <laughs> but uh, the winemaker also owned the vineyard. So he came and he brought like five wines and the chefs there were pairing foods and, you know, what wine folks do. And um, he, he was telling a story and he said, you know, when I first, I came from Napa, and when I first bought this vineyard, I was real worried because we had late freeze. You know, the the vines didn't bud like they should have, I thought. And when they finally budded, they flowered really fast and the grapes just exploded in growth. They grew way too fast to suit me. And shoot, before long, the grapes are ripe. They were ready to go. And so I, I called my mentor in Napa and she said, hey, um, I just got a text. She said, she said, uh, she said, um, have you checked the bricks, the acidity, the color, the juice? And he said, yes, I did. Are they all good? She said, he said, yes. She said, harvest your grapes. 
And he said, well, kind of tell me what you're thinking. And she, she just made it succinctly. She said, out here in Napa, we have 125 perfect grape growing days spread out over about a 250 day growing season. There, your 125 days are in a row. Man, a light bulb went off in my head and I raised my hand and said, hey, wait a minute. Um, what is a perfect grape growing day? And he said, well, when the temperature is between 55 and about 82 or 83 degrees. And I thought, holy cow, that's a perfect bass growing day. So I went back and started checking the National Weather Service records and looking at history of, of weather and temperatures in that part of the world. And I figured out that pretty much everywhere in the United States, pretty much there's 125 perfect bass growing days in every state, That whether it's Nebraska, Texas, Louisiana. But the difference is in Texas where I live and even in Nebraska, you're going to have 125 perfect days spread out over a longer time because going to what Frank James is asking, when the water temperature gets above about 83 or 84, that perfect bass growing day is gone. Those fish are more worried about surviving the heat and the, their metabolic rate drops. They're not eating like they should. They're not gaining like they should. So I was able to take that out of the box. We had as many growing days. We just had to consolidate and make those fish grow as fast as they could in that span of time. So when you're getting ready to grow some trophy fish, you got to understand that you want to take advantage of those perfect days. That's why we say feed your bait fish two or three times a day when you've got the perfect temperatures for it. And right now, based on Frank's question, he says, um, uh, how does it affect largemouth bass growth? Every day we have where the water temperature is under 85 degrees, you know, that's a perfect bass growing day. Now, when you're getting up around 85, that's a little bit too warm. Now, keep in mind that the temperature, if you're not aerating your pond, the temperature at the surface is going to get scalding hot in the afternoon, and the temperature is going to drop 10 or 12 degrees in the top six inches overnight. So if you were to check the, if you were to check the temperatures in the morning, it'd be 10 degrees cooler at daylight than it will be 12 hours later, you know, during the heat of the, of the summer day. So the temperature at the surface, the top 10 or 12 inches, is going to fluctuate. But when you get down a little bit below that, it's going to fluctuate a little bit less. You know, so uh, the bottom line is, 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 yes, having a milder summer is going to influence our ability to grow more bass, grow bigger bass. So here's, here's where I'm going to go. I want to scroll through these comments right quick and try to stay ahead of that. Travis Paul Smith, Texas Hunter Feeders are full of that awesome Aquamax MVP. <laughs> I love that. There's Josh Jones. Hey, Josh, good to see you. Robert Hudson, good to see you. Um, you know, I do want to. I do want to take a minute since Travis brought it up. I do want to thank Texas Hunter Feeders for helping sponsor this show. They've been a Pond Boss advertiser for a long, long time. Here they are, right inside. I mean, you open the magazine, there they are. And I totally believe in Texas Hunter. I know the owner. You know, I know the the staff, and I know the products, and I know the customer service. And those guys are outstanding. Of course, they just recently sold out to Pradco, so maybe I don't know the owner now, but I know I know who was before in that MVP. Uh, Purina Mills, also a sponsor of this show. I've been working with them since 1995. They approached me, us, Pond Boss, for us to help them fill a niche in our market. And what they told me back then was, hey, we see this pond management market is, is a growing spot, a growing market, what can we do to provide products to help you? Well, that's when Game Fish Chow was born. And then they started refining the Aquamax products and, and, and seeking out good uh, research on nutritional needs for bluegill and hybrid stroppers and largemouth bass, etc. And they've created some of the best foods. And MVP, I love it because there's nine pellet sizes. Some of them sink. The smaller ones sink. So those less aggressive fish, especially bluegills, can get something to eat. And I'm a big, big fan of Purina simply because, not only because they produce great products, but I hear from them continually. If they're, if you give me feedback, and not all the feedback's been good over the years, I'm going to tell you that, especially with distribution. You know, there's not there's, there's not been much call about the, the quality of the product, but there's been some call about distribution. They've got that all ironed out and have for several years. So I'm a big fan, and they I have their ear, and they've got mine. All right, there's, uh, let's see, Chuck Elmquist from Southwest Iowa. Bob Mayer from Aiken, South Carolina. Lots of good guys over there from Aiken. 
Josh Jones, what were you saying about Dave Beasley? Dave Beasley's got an article coming up in the next issue of Pond Boss. Now, Dave Beasley, you know, you heard me tell the story about the upstate New York. Well, we hired Dave Beasley when he was in college to work on this private hunting and fishing resort in upstate New York. That's where he cut his teeth. That's where he really started learning about fish while he was in college. He was at Cobleskill, SUNY Cobleskill. And um, uh, Mark Cornwell was one of his professors. And Mark introduced us to Dave. We brought him on board. Dave ran the hatchery program. We taught him there. And he would, he'd come up on weekends and weekdays when he could because it was about a three-hour ride for him to come over. But uh, and, and I've helped Dave become a writer. So Dave's got an article coming up in the next issue of Pond Boss, the September, October one, about raising trophy fish in small waters. And I read it today. It's a really good article. He did a good job on it. Let's see here. Chris Miller, good evening. Brian Baker from Branson, Missouri. Boy, I wonder, you know, I love Branson, Missouri. I love Big Cedar. I love Bass Pro Shops. You know, Johnny Morris, all those, everybody there. Um... Hope you guys are doing well. I can't imagine what's going on in Branson with this damn virus thing going on. Chris Miller, evening. Kevin Wright, Travis. Beard and stash looking good. Yeah, I did get a trim. <laughs> yeah, I kind of... If I let that... If I let all this stuff kind of go nuts, my wife goes nuts. She don't like it. She wants me kind of doing it. Keeping it good. Let's see here. Thanks for the compliments, Steve Lewis. Hey, Wayne Lancaster, watching Palm Boss at the Pond. Woo! All right. Bosque County, good to see you home, buddy. That's great. Zach Cook, lately I've been seeing what I think are roundworms coming out of my bluegill's poop shoot. That's a that's a scientific description. I like that. Is it something I should worry about? Um, you know, I've answered a lot of questions. <laughs> and I've seen that. And the answer I'm going to give you is... I'm going to ask you a question. Are they tapeworms or are they roundworms? Now, if, if you've got worms and you're feeding them, you can do something about it. But if you're not feeding them, that's not uncommon. We just don't like it. You know, now, be sure the worms aren't poop. Like, here, I'm going to take, hey, Zach, listen to me. Do this. Squeeze your bluegill. Reach over there and pull that worm out and squish it and see what it does. If it's brown and gooey, nothing to worry about. <laughs> If it's got sections and it breaks off, it's a tapeworm. We can have that conversation. Let's see. Harrison Davis checking in from Georgia. Nathan Reisdorf. Good evening. Just wonder if South Texas gets a lot of rain this weekend from a tropical storm. Should I keep the aeration system running or shut it down and give it a week or two to settle out and keep it running? Now, here's the, here's the caveat on that, Nathan. When you've got your aeration system going, what, what we advise people to do is to run that aeration system from like 9 at night till 9 in the morning in South Texas this time of year so the water doesn't get too hot. So here's what I'm going to tell you. Run it like you've been running it. If you've, ha if you've had it running on a timer for 12 hours a day, keep it on that. If you've been running it 24-7, keep it doing that. Because what will happen when you get that fresh water, it's going to dilute your water, whatever's in it. It's going to cool it down, but... The aeration system is going to keep the temperature fairly autonomous and it won't drop so fast, you know, and it will be more stable. So run it just like you've been running it. Don't turn it off. Harrison Davis, what's the perfect minimum temperature for, for growing largemouth bass? Uh, the range is 55 to 83. The perfect temperatures are about 62 to 78. If you're somewhere, and, and if you really want to pick the perfect temperature for growing bass, that's going to be 68 to 75. That's when bass grow the fastest, if they've got all things equal. Let's see here. Tim Stewart's checking in. Any good source for tiger muskies in New York? I tell you what, uh, send an email to, let me think about it just a minute. They all come out of Minnesota. Um, you might talk to Nate Herman or Dave Beasley at Solitude because I'm sure that some will come to New Jersey in the fall. Yep. All right. Let's see here. Josh Jones. I've heard him tell that story about the New York. Yep. Well, yep. I got to help train Dave Beasley when he was still pooping yellow since we're talking about stuff like that. 
Let's see here. Watching from the middle of Gulf of Mexico, Tate Smith. What? Good gosh, you must be bored. The tuna not biting or what? Let's see. 650 already. I'm going to kind of ramp it up because I know we got folks wanting to hear about trophy fish. Let's see what Lance Fredrickson says real quick. Hey, sir, I have a seven, a three quarter acre to one acre new pond in East Texas. Forage fish are doing fabulous and introduced this there this spring. I'm getting different advice on stocking the predator fish. I want to stock largemouth bass, but I'm debating strappers or catfish. I'm looking for a fun fishery that we eat a lot from, not caring too much about trophies. If you want to eat a lot of fish, stock catfish. You can raise more catfish per unit of water in a three quarter to one acre pond than you can any other fish. You know, if you want hybrid strappers, that's great. They grow fast. They won't supply the same amount of meat. You can feed either hybrid strappers or channel catfish and grow them really, really big. But you can grow more pounds per unit of water of channel catfish than you ever will with hybrid strappers. All right, Matt Singley, I have a small pond around four acres. It's been on family land for years and I've fished it a few times this summer and I'm catching bluegill brim over a pound and a few over a pound. We haven't been feeding these fish. Do you think if we started feeding Korean MVP would help get these brim bigger than they are now? Absolutely, no doubt about it, yes. Unless they've aged out. If they're seven or eight years old, you may get a, a weight gain, but then when they hit their age limit, like all of us, they're going to deteriorate. You know, so as long as they're fairly young, there's no doubt in my mind that MVP was designed to do just that thing. Let's see, Kelly Nathan Lewicki. Nathan just got done doing a lead treatment for my turtles, so your turtles got to use, got to exercise your second right, second uh, amendment rights. Then, currently running nine to nine. You bet, Nathan. Keep doing that, man. Scott Sumner have a lot of natural black willows around a pond of mine. Should I plan to take care of these at the right time, or is an if it doesn't bother you, don't bother deal? Water levels seem to hold steady. Here's my only catch. 22 about willow trees there's several things i don't like about them there's several things i do sometimes that's just the only thing you're going to grow for shade fast but since they're fast growing they also slough a lot and they transpire a lot of water a full-grown black willow tree will transpire 100 gallons a day so the key statement in you what you made there with your question is the water level stays up you know if you're out in the western states and you've got willows they're going to suck a pond way 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 down Zach squeezed them out last night, so he's ahead of me, and they were brownish red, not segmented, and I feed MVP twice a day. I don't think that's an issue. Zach, I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't think that's an issue. Now, what it probably is, is as some fish age, they're more susceptible to parasites. So if they've got worms in their bellies, that's not uncommon, you know, but it is uncommon for them to poop them out, which that usually means that they're there in excess. Next time you catch a fish that looks like that, go ahead and sacrifice it. Cut it open and take a look at it. Let's see here. Let me see where we are here. And I'm, I, prom I promise you I'm going to get right back into that topic because I just want to get ahead here. Um, let's see. Whoa. I'm getting behind. Robert Hudson, my one-and-a-half-year-old bluegills love Aquamax 500. Aquamax 500 is perfect for bluegill that size because it's Aquamax 500 is little bitty pellets, which fits right in the mouth. You know, 42% protein, fish meal-based fish food, perfect for carnivore, you know, for, as far as fish foods go. So that's real good. Let's see. Greg Baker, suggested literature for a wildlife biology student with limited exposure to fisheries management. Howdy from Sulphur Springs. Good to see you there, Greg. I would uh, spend some time on the on the Pond Boss Forum. And, um, of course, the American Fishery Society has got all kinds of great literature. However, a bunch of that's just not applicable to small waters management. If you'll uh, look at, at, at um, palmboss.com, click on Ask the Boss, look at the forum, all kinds of really good advice. And we also have quite a few free articles and lots of videos that you can look at there as well. Brock Wren, how big of a risk to red-eared sliders post to our ponds? Kill everyone we can. I'll tell you this, if a, if a slider catches a fish, the fish deserved it. <laughs> Uh, the thing that sliders, the only risk that sliders pose, they're not going to eat fish enough to affect the population. Now, what they will do is they can disrupt reproduction. They can disrupt nests. You know, they'll eat your fish food. So if you think they're too numerous, thin them out. You know, you can, you can buy traps where you can trap them and move them and give them to your neighbor. There's Mike DeMint from Memphis, Tennessee. Good to see Mike. Calvin Perry go forth on the issue of water. Ooh. 
I just scrolled around real fast here. Bear with me here. On the issue of water temperature in bass was on Welsh the other day, and it's being a power plant lake. The lake service temperature was over 100. Can you talk a bit about high temperatures and bass growth rates? Because most power plant lakes seem to have a healthy population of bass that are often in the fairly large weight range. Yeah, let me tell you about that, Calvin. That happens in the fall and the winter because those lakes don't get cold. They don't get cold to get down under that minimum temperature like all the other lakes do. So when you're on a lake like Welsh and some of the other power plant lakes, when they're generating, the temperature goes up in the, in the winter. So that actually spreads the season out even more. Right now, it's stressful. You know, now what happens, this 100 degree water temperature, that water is, 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 is less dense. So it's floating on top. If you were to go down and check 25 feet down, the water's probably going to be in the 80s, maybe the mid 80s. And that's where those bass are going to be. I'd be stunned if you told me you caught a 10 pound bass and three feet of water in a 100 degree lake. That would surprise me. I wouldn't say you were lying, but I'd think it. Um, Dan Snyder added Florida bass fingerlings last summer. We're currently removing any bass under two pounds. Should we stop? Should we? Yeah, I would. I'd change that. Uh, when you put Florida bass fingerlings last summer, they're a year old. You don't need to be removing any bass. You need to remove zero bass. Now, here's the way I see that. A, a year later, I'm, now I'm, I'm making an assumption here based on what you've typed. The, uh, the, I'm assuming that this is a brand new lake with brand new stocked forage fish and brand new bass. You don't need to cull anything, anything at all. You don't even need to think about culling anything and depending on your stocking rates, probably until at least two years. So if you're culling bass at under two pounds, you're probably taking the very best fish off that fishery, taking them out and you're gonna mess it up. So I wouldn't take out any bass at all in that, um, time frame. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm making some assumptions here. All right, Greg Baker, perfect. Thank you. Got it. Yep, yep, yep. See, Chris Miller, any recommendations for establishing aquatic vegetation in a new pond? Has about four feet of water in it currently, southern Indiana with clay and shale. Um, I'll tell you this. I don't usually plant plants. I wait to see what nature's going to do. When you get some migratory waterfowl coming through there, you're going to get some seeds coming out of the south end of a northbound good duck, and uh, you're going to be able to to have some plants growing. Now, if plants don't grow, it's not necessarily because they aren't there. It's because the conditions aren't right. You don't have the right amount of topsoil. You don't have the right fertility. You don't have, you know, if water fluctuates, it's harder for fish, to, for plants to, to get established. So I like to wait 18 months or two years. Actually, I like to wait a couple of years before I think about planting any plants and see what grows. And nature typically grows something, and if you like it, we keep it. If you don't, we change it. And that's how I like to do things. Let's see here. Um, Harrison Davis, no one of the sunny arrays in the state grows huge bass. There you go. Brian Lawrence, been making ceviche with bluegill and wipers. I love ceviche, especially made with, with bass, bluegill, and wipers. It was told not to use freshwater fish due to worms, baloney. I don't believe that at all. I don't, I don't buy that at all. Uh, uh, now there, there may be some fish somewhere that like Japan that you shouldn't do that with, but I have not come across that circumstance, that warning at all with freshwater fish in private waters. So, you know, my dad gum, um, my common sense is telling me just, if you want to make ceviche out of your hybrid striped bass and they've been in your pond, fed your feed, same with the bluegill, make ceviche. Harrison Davis is moving to California. Holy cow, I thought you were in the pond management business over there in Georgia. Or is that just kind of a tongue-in-cheek deal? Chris Miller, perfect, thank you. Okay, I'm caught up, so let's talk about raising trophy fish. Before I do that, I want to say thank you one more time and invite you guys to subscribe to Pond Boss Magazine. 35 bucks a year, cheaper than a Friday night date. You guys know the drill here. 35 bucks lasts you a year. A Friday night date is gone in an hour and a half, and you forget about it a day or two later. So, uh, and full of nuggets, man. Every time I talk to a subscriber, they say, golly, I, I love that paragraph in such and such on page 28, you know, and, and really, truly, this, this, this magazine is what fuels the economy for Pond Boss and allows us to put this show on. Yeah, do we, do we appreciate sponsorships from Easy Doc, <clears throat> Texas Hunter, Karina Mills? You bet we do. We appreciate their support and et cetera. And, uh, you know, in their advertising and everything. <clears throat> but if you don't subscribe to the magazine, that's what makes it all tick. No subscribers, what's the magazine? You know, and so uh, 
we do we do need to keep keep, keep growing that subscriber base. All right, let's talk about growing trophy fish. You know, one of the holy cow, there's a Chris Blood. See the Peruvian ceviche recipe. Hey, hey, hey yeah, I love that. Uh, Chris's wife is is Peruvian, and we were with Chris. Chris is Texas on her feeders, by the way, and uh, she made some astonishing, astonishingly good uh, ceviche. And oh my gosh, we uh, we took pictures of her and it and us and put that in Pond Boss. Gosh, I don't remember what what issue that was, but we do have a ceviche recipe. So let's talk about growing trophy fish now. One of the first things, if, if you come to me and say, I want to grow trophy fish, I'm going to ask you, what does that mean? What's a trophy to you? You know, I've, I've had people say, well, uh, uh, I've never caught a bass bigger than four pounds, so anything bigger than four pounds with a largemouth bass is a trophy for me. I've had people come and say, you know what? My, my bucket list for bluegill is a pound and a half bluegill, and I've never caught one bigger than three quarters of a pound. You know, some folks, I got a call from a guy last year that said, hey, I've been hearing this about these tiger muskies, and I've got a pond in central Illinois. I'd really like to put some tiger muskies in. How big will they get? You know, they'll get to be 40 inches if you give them enough time, and they got enough small fish to eat. You know, so first thing you do is define what trophy means to you. I just got a message. Yeah, okay, figures. So, um... All right, okay, Dan Snyder, we added the Florida fingerlings to an existing 10-year-old pond that we're catching multiple four, five, and six, seven-pound fish in. Still remove fish under two pounds. Uh, I would weigh and measure. I'll tell, tell you what I would do, Dan. I would weigh and measure every fish I catch if I'm thinking about culling it. If the relative weight is under 85, cull it. If it's 90 or better, leave it in there. If it's somewhere between 85 and 90, make a judgment call, then you decide. But just because you catch a 12-inch bass that is 12 inches, you shouldn't cull it. If you catch one of those Florida bass that you stocked a year ago when it's 12 inches long and it looks like a football, it needs to go back in the lake because that's your recruitment. That's your junior varsity, and you need to keep those. So that's what I'm going to tell you. I, I do think in a 10-year-old pond, you really need to be culling fish, but I think with since you're monkeying with the genetics, you need to be highly selective about the fish that you take out. And I would use the electric fishing boat to cull a few because you don't want to be selecting your most aggressive fish. Now, that actually plays a role in producing trophy fish. So here's the thing about trophy fish. Every pond has a carrying capacity. It can only grow and then sustain and support a finite amount of pounds of fish per unit of water. For example, if you're going to... I read a post at, on Pond Boss uh, Forum today where a guy decided he was going to restock a pond five years ago because he was going to retire in five years. So he went fishing, didn't catch any fish, saw a couple of catfish come to a feeder and didn't see any bluegills. So he restocked it, forgot about it, came back five years later, and it was exactly like it was five years ago. So there's something going on in that pond that won't allow it to produce very many fish without something being changed. You know, the, the point I'm going to here is is a, a, a pond is going to have some carrying capacity based on its productivity and what's harvested from it. All right, so now when you start talking about growing really big fish, job number one is you got to have the very best water. Think about this. If you've got an acid water lake like over in... Um, in the Carolinas, East Texas, parts of Arkansas, Alabama, even Florida, if you've got water that's acidic, then you can see the pH fluctuate through the course of a day. You can see it go up, go down, go up, because it doesn't have any buffering capacity. It doesn't have the alkalinity that it needs. So when you can see a three-point swing in pH simply because there's plants growing in sunlight, that's stressful on fish. Even though, even though the temperature may be perfect, even though the habitat's perfect, if that water fluctuates chemically and biologically, that's a stressor for the fish. And if they're fighting to survive, they can't thrive nearly as well. So job one, when you want to grow trophy fish, and Nathan down there in South Texas, what you're doing with your aeration system and everybody else that's aerating, you're moving the water vertically to create currents which creates autonomous health top to bottom. 
You know, now there's some caveats with that, but I'll tell you this. When the water is autonomous and the temperature's stable and the chemistry stable and the biology stable, the fish can thrive in that, even if it's not perfect. Now listen to that. Even if it's not perfect, they can still thrive in it if it's stable. That's a big deal. That's how we can grow gigantic fish at pH of 5.3 at Richmond Mill Lake in Laurenburg, North Carolina, where there's seven to 10,000 gallons flowing over the spillway every minute of every day. You know, and so uh, uh, stable water is healthy water. That's the, that's, the, that's the foundation on which fish need. Second thing they need is food. You know, it, and, and when you read Beasley's article in the next issue of Pond Boss, he's got a small pond that they've been working on for a couple of years that, um, uh, that where they're trying to grow trophy largemouth bass, hybrid strippers, and bluegills. And they're feeding the bluegills and feeding the hybrid strippers, but they're feeding the largemouth bass that won't eat fish food. They're having to supplementally stock forage fish and grow as many forage fish as they can. So what their data is starting to show that it's, yes, it's true that it takes about 10 pounds of bait fish for a bass to gain a pound, but, but, and this is a big but, depending on your circumstances, what does it take for that fish to maintain that pound once he gets it and once she gets it? You know, another thing that, going back to uh, the question a while ago about culling two pound bass, Almost every single two-pound bass you've got is a female. And those females deserve a chance to see if they're going to excel. That's why you're looking at relative weights. That's why you're weighing and measuring some fish. You want to judge their growth rates. You want to judge their body condition. So just because it's two pounds doesn't mean it needs to be chunked. Because 99% of the bass that are two pounds or bigger are females. And you got to have females... That's where the big fish come from with largemouth bass. So when you're trying to, uh, circling back on the food, great water, adequate food every day of the fish's life. Now, if you think about that, if you're depending on your pond to grow all the food that it needs to produce your trophy fish, you're going to be behind the curve at some point because fish spawn, then they quit. Baby fish grow, get eaten, get bigger, can't get eaten, then there's a void. Every pond has a void at some point of bait fish. Now, if there's not a void, that means that your predator fish are in low numbers and the bait fish are going to gain a foothold and grow larger and expand their population and take up more space. So that's where it starts getting a little bit complicated and that's where you do a balancing act with your harvest plan. Like we we're talking about earlier, harvesting two pound bass. So uh, where I'm going with this is is we know it takes 10 pounds of bait fish for a game fish, whether it's a bluegill or a channel cat, a hybrid striper, a largemouth bass, a smallmouth bass, a yellow perch. It takes 10 pounds of bait fish for those fish to gain a pound. It takes 10 pounds of living food. Now think about that a minute. That living food, if you were to take 10 pounds of shiner minnows, fathead minnows, bluegill, whatever, and ring them out, you're going to have a little over eight pounds of goodies. I mean, that pound, eight pounds of water and two pounds of goodies. So that conversion rate, when you, know, when you start listening to the guys with a feed and fish food, their conversion rates are 1.3, 1 1.4 to 1. Those conversion rates are dry weight. Now, what nobody really has figured out, because it's based on each circumstance, is what does it take for those fish to maintain that pound once they gain it? So what does it take for a 10-pound bass to stay 10 pounds? We know it's going to have to eat a pound to get to 11, but what does it have to eat to stay at 10? You know, and the numbers are starting to look like, in my opinion, that it's going to be closer to 20 pounds of bait fish per pound of gain to gain it and keep it. Now, so that's going to be determined by energy use, which revolves around temperature, how far that fish has got to go to eat, how many meals it's got to eat? If it can eat, like if a 10 pound bass can eat a one and a half pound bass, that's way, way, way more efficient than if it's got to go chase down five or six five inch bluegills or seven inch bluegills or a half pound gizzard shad or whatever. So, bottom line is you got to supply your forage fish. Now, if you really want to grow some big, big, big fish, 
I believe supplemental feeding is very important. Supplement, supplemental feeding, the bluegill, if you feed the bluegills, you're going to see fecundity go up. You're going to see body condition go up. You're going to decrease their competition in the food chain naturally. Well, if you want to call feeding natural, you know, um, because let's face it, if you're wanting to grow some trophy fish and you want to scoot around the time frame that it takes for it to happen in nature, which is a long time, you know, then you're going to have to, you're going to have to do some husbandry things. You have to treat your pond more like a feedlot and less like a natural pond. Now, that's a personal choice. I have guys tell me, I, I don't want to feed fish. Had a guy call me from Wisconsin the day before yesterday. He said, on Sunday, I guess Sunday afternoon, he called me. He got my number off of one of these videos. And, and I guess I lost my mind and put that number out there. <laughs> Not really. But uh, anyway, he called me. He says, hey, I'm in Wisconsin. And I've been hearing you talk about feeding fish. Is there anything I can do other than that? Because I really want my pond to be natural. Plus, the state of Wisconsin frowns on feeding the fish. They really don't want us feeding fish, in which I knew that. But um, I said, you know what? If you want to speed up the process, you feed the fish. If you want to grow bigger fish, you feed the fish. If you want to grow more fish and support more fish, you feed the fish. You know, now, what I told him his choices were, he's up in fathead minnow country. If you want to try to grow some big smallmouth bass and some big walleyes and start... Start buying those fathead minnows by the gallon bucket and start feeding them fathead minnows. Feed them as many bluegills as you can get. Feed them as many fatheads. Now, of course, some of the guys out there are going to start shaking their heads and say, well, doesn't that cost a lot of money? Well, so does a bass boat that you're never going to catch a 10-pound bass with. You know, so it, to me, that's all relative. Um, if you're going to, if you want to grow a trophy bass, you got to supply the food, whether it's living food or food coming out of a sack, coming out of a feeder. So both ways, and I think if you're going to grow big, big, big fish and multiple species in the same pond, you need to be doing both. You need to be supplementing crawfish, tilapia if you can, if it's legal, bluegill, the right kinds of minnows at the right time. Now another thing about trying to grow trophy fish, timing is huge. When your pond is producing the most fish, uh, you guys that know anything about deer hunting, you know that in the fall when the mast is high and there's acorns all over the ground, you're, those deer are not going to come to your protein feed. You know, the same thing in a pond. When you've got abundant forage fish, they're going to rely on that. But what you got to figure out, just like with the deer, when, when they're coming out of the winter, you, they better be being fed protein because now you got a bunch of pregnant does, you know, that are getting ready to lactate <clears throat> and everything's up under snow or gone, you know, and you haven't had any spring growth yet. So you got to be supplementing. Look at your pond the same way. There's going to be voids. Now, there's several ways to check those voids. You can, you can survey it. You know, if, you, if you've got a pond that you've built, be sure and leave an open area where you can pull a seine around. You go, go buy, <coughs> go to Memphis Net and Twine and buy a 50-foot seine six feet deep and uh, get one of your buddies and you guys go seine shallow areas. And as long as you're finding abundant numbers of a variety of different small fish, you're good. If you start seeing their numbers diminish, think about stocking some more if you really want to grow great big fish. So, growing big fish takes a lot of food, good, clean, healthy water, but what else does it take? Somebody say something. That's right. That's right. Good genetics. You know, if you take a, a, a typical, and I saw Trey Carpenter, who's a Trey is a, uh, I didn't get to say hi to Trey a while ago, but he's a wildlife biologist, retired from the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, stellar biologist, and he manages some ponds as well, and, and he'll be the first one to tell you that if you're going to look at genetics, a deer that looks like that, that ain't it. You know, now, of course, every once in a while, one of those little spikes will grow up and be something special, but not normally. You know, so you got to figure out what are the spikes in your pond and figure out when you need to cull them and when you need to feed them. You know, and so uh, uh, where I'm going is um, good water, excellent food, fill the voids, Figure out when that is, line it up with your pond management company, go ahead and bite the bullet and buy something. You know, whether it's tilapia to reproduce, crawfish, minnows, more bluegills, fill the voids. But in order to fill the voids, you have to know you have one. The third thing is genetics. Uh, that's what I was talking about with the deer. Yep, genetics. If you don't have great genetics, don't expect to have great fish. Now here's the here's where it gets ticklish. Just because your fish have great genetics is no assurance and no guarantee 
the, any of those fish are going to become trophies. Now, I want to let that soak in just for a minute. Just because you have great genetics, there is no guarantee that any of those fish are going to become trophies. You've got to do your part to provide great water, outstanding food every day, which means that you're going to be monitoring and filling the void. Then the genetics can play a significant role. Okay, so what the way that works is, is let's just take, let's say, um, let's go back to the 10 acre lake where he stocked Florida bass last year. I didn't, I don't remember the number, but I'm going to pick the number 1,000. Let's say they stocked 1,000 Florida bass, pure strain Florida bass into a 10 acre lake that's got existing fish where they've been culling bass smaller than two pounds. All right, so if they've been doing that culling program, they've probably taken out 300 to 400 bass through the course of a year. When that happens, that leaves a void that young fish can fill. So let's take that 1,000 bass, and let's say that 90% of them get eaten. <laughs> that leaves 100. Out of that 100, and that's not unreasonable. That can happen, and I, I would expect that to happen. It's 716. I'll come back to the questions here in just a minute. But out of that 100 that's left, we would expect that half of those are girls. And if we were real lucky, they'd all be, all be girls. But let's expect that half of them are girls. There's 50. Out of those 50, there's going to be about 25 or 30% with the genetic propensity to grow large and the aggressive nature to do that. That's 15 or so. Then there's another 10 or 12 that might be slightly above average in their aggressiveness and their propensity. The rest won't have it. So as long as those fish are the ones that thrive and you can protect those, you got a greater shot at growing really, really, really big fish. And that's with bluegill, that's with bass, that's with hybrid stripers. Now they, they all have different environmental um, requirements with habitat and with food and with the timing. So all that kind of comes in and plays a, a role in, in your management strategy. So, and the, the last thing is a harvest plan. You gotta, you gotta have a harvest plan. Look at your pond like a garden. If you really want to grow trophy fish, protect the trophies and protect those that have the opportunity to become a trophy. Now you gotta get to where you can discern that. Now you can take away some of the discernment by actually weighing and measuring some fish and comparing them to the standard lengths and weights of that species. You can find that on Pond Boss at pondboss.com. And when you start weighing and measuring a few fish, then you're going to quickly get an eye for it. And you can see those, those true trophies, their relative weights might be 125. So for example, an 18 inch bass should weigh three and a quarter. If your 18 inch bass weigh almost four pounds, it's going to have a deep body depth, wide girth, you know, short, stocky, Structure with a smaller than normal looking mouth, that's the fish you want to preserve. So by weighing and measuring and setting some standards to cull by, then you can protect the best of the best. And I'm also a big fan of, of tagging some of those fish. If you truly want to grow trophy fish, you can monitor individual growth rates on individual fish. And then using that data, you can also extrapolate if, in other words, if you, if you uh, let's say you um, tag 30 bass, for example, or 30 blue, pick 30 something, you, you tag 30 fish. And then if you catch 100 and 30 of them are tagged, then you're going to begin to extrapolate about how many fish you've got in there. And then you can determine, help you determine how many fish need to be culled. Then you compare these fish to themselves compared to the other fish that are tagged compared to the rest of the fish in the population. And once you do all that, then you're going to be knowledgeable enough to know that you can go to the next level of pre preserving the very best fish that you want to grow to huge sizes. So you can't just depend on fish food. You can't just depend on Mother Nature. You can't just depend on um, enough bait fish and it all be food. You can't depend just on genetics. You got one more little thing besides harvesting that you got to pay attention to. Anytime you take a body of water or a field or any environment and you push it past what Mother Nature wants it to be, there's going to be pushback. 
I'll never forget Richmond Mill Lake when we were growing those big bluegills and and they still have some great bluegills and big bass. One of the things we noticed, there were 50 feeders on that lake. And we were growing fish like crazy. Food bill was $25,000 a year, but it was worth it because what we were getting out of that acid water. We grew some huge fish. That are, many of them are still there to this day. We started that in 2005 or six, 2006, I think it was. And oh my gosh, within three years, we were catching bluegill a pound and a quarter, pound and a half. Fourth year, two pound bluegills. Fifth year, sixth year, two and a half, three pound bluegills. Well, what we also noticed, here come, we saw an alligator one day. Ospreys built a nest and they began to breed. Uh, bald eagles showed up. <clears throat> one thing we noticed, a couple of feeders seem to be going empty faster than the rest of them. And they're all sitting on, on um, um, stands out in the water. We would fill them from a pontoon boat. We'd, we, could, we had a, a barge where we could put uh, a pallet of feed on it and they go fill up all the feeders at once, and, uh, which was pretty cool. Uh, but we noticed a couple of the feeders timer set the same. So we set up some game cameras. Raccoons were swimming 40 yards out in the water, climbing up on the, the little platform, spinning the spinner on the feeders and eat the fish food. So the caretaker started setting traps in two weeks. He caught 98 raccoons eating fish food. 98 cormorant showed up river otters showed up. So when you start, trying to push your water beyond its natural limits, you're going to garner the attention of somebody else out there that wants to take advantage of your hard work. I've had more calls this year about river otters than all the other years combined. You know, guys are beginning to see that river otters are a problem. I saw Dave Weber back up there. I think Dave made a comment. So I'm going to take a few minutes and go back. So that's, that's pretty much the, the um, conversation I wanted to have about growing big fish. That's a really good start. Let's see, there's Chuck Brinkman. I had somebody call me referred by Bob Brinkman today, Chuck. A guy over there in uh, south of uh, St. Louis somewhere. Let's see, Dan Snyder, thank you, you bet. Mike Cottrell, can you add gypsum this time of year? Yes, you can. Willie Howe, Willie Howe, my neighbor checking in. Jeff Thompson, bushy pond weed in about 15% of the shallow water. At what point does it become a problem? What would you treat it with? Well, here's the thing. This time of year, you got to be careful about whether you treat plants or not because if you kill plants too many right now, the herbicide isn't going to take you out, but the plants dying and decomposing sure can. So you got to be picky about how many plants you kill and when you do it. 15% um, really is a good number. I like 15% because think about it. If you got bushy pond weed in 15% of the water, it is a safe haven for your young of the year bait fish. So if you're young of the year, now this goes back to the discussion about trophy fish. If you've got baby bluegills, for example, and if you've got a bass lake, you've got baby bluegills, or you don't have a good bass lake. When those baby bluegills are first hatched, about that big, you know, little bitty scooters, 12,000 of them weigh a pound. If you can keep them alive 45 days, they're 30 per pound, about that big. Now, when that happens, they become something more significant as a forage fish. They can hide in that bushy pond weed. They can feed in it. Now, they're not necessarily going to eat the pondweed, but they're going to eat what's clinging to it with paraphyton, small insects, zooplankton that are in there, microscopic little critters and things that, that, that thrive in that environment that protects them. So they're protected, plus they have some food. 15% is a good number. Now, if it gets up to 35 or 40% covering a pond, that's getting to be invasive for fishing, and it's getting to be a little bit invasive for the fishery. Once it hits about 50 to 60%, now you're in trouble. If it gets beyond that, ugh, harsh. But 15%, actually, I recommend that much. I don't like to see it get much beyond 25 because then it's invasive for your enjoyment of the pond. Uh, if you're going to treat it, you know what? I, I, I have to tell you, I, I stopped treating plants about 10 years ago and I delegated that. Uh, but back when I was still treating plants, if I were going to choose a herbicide for um, bushy pondweed, I would pick Aquathol. However, if Kelly Duffy's watching tonight, he'll chime in and tell you something different because there's some newer products, more efficient, less costly products out there now. But all I can tell you is what I know. Let's see, Chuck Brinkman done said howdy do, Chuck. Good to see Chuck. Let's see here. You feed the fish, you feed the fish, you feed the fish. <laughs> Atta boy, Dave Weber. Good to see you. Dave, I'm glad you're back on here. I haven't, I've missed you, pal. 
Harrison Davis, if you could go back in time and look at some natural ponds with bluegill and bass and other native fish, how much vegetation, fallen logs, et cetera, cover would you see? If I designed it, knowing what I know now, uh, i tell you what I would do. I would be doing about 25 to 30% of the entire pond with a variety of uh, habitat. I see Josie texting me. Hi, Josie. I'll read your text when we finish up here in a few minutes. I'll get right back to you. Um, anyway, uh, I would like to have 25 to 30% of that body of water with a variety of habitat where I can maximize reproduction of the forage fish, minimize, listen to this, minimize reproduction of my sport fish because I'm not worried about recruitment, especially a largemouth bass. And if I want to grow big bluegill, I don't really want them to reproduce that much. But if bluegill are a forage, I want them to reproduce a lot. So I want to provide a variety of habitat, such as American pondweed, eel grass, some of the uh, sedges around the edges, things like that. I'd want to have some fallen logs for the bigger fish. I'd want to have some channels and cuts and humps and things like that. I'd want to have 30% <coughs> of the pond. Here, here's one of, my, one of my sayings I figured out years and years and years ago. I still believe it. 90% of the fish are going to live in 10% of the water of any pond on any given day. Now, if you think about that, there's some truth to that. I've seen it over and over and over with my electrofishing surveys and draining ponds and catching fish and sampling fish. 90% of the fish are going to live in 10% of the pond on any given day. Now, that 10% changes with the seasons. In the summertime, they're not going to be up in that 100 degree water. They're going to be out in deeper water right against the thermocline or right in the thermocline, close to structure if they can find it. That's why underwater humps are great. If you've got some underwater humps that kind of stick the top two feet up out of where your thermocline is, and you've got some enhancements on that, like rock piles or some brush or things, it's going to hold fish. You know, so that that's my answer to that. Uh, and, it, and, and that would encourage me to manage that pond in a more natural way, as long as I had good, happy water and the very, very best habitat, and then stocking rates that were smart in the beginning, the right kind of food chain, Genetics as desired, and then a thoughtful harvest program. You can grow some big bass in natural ponds. You really can. <clears throat> I mean, just look around. All the state records come out of big bodies of water, and there's reasons for that. It's because all those things have come together for those fish to grow large. And if you can replicate that in a pond and manage it in a natural way without feeding fish, without fertilizing, you know, without a whole bunch of this other husbandry stuff, you can grow some big fish. You just can't grow as many. Okay, let's say uh, 1820 or 1720. Um, I dress different. I know that. And if knowing what I know now, I'd be looking more at ponds for food, especially bass bluegill ponds. So I would be trying to support ponds for food in 1820 so I could feed more people. I wouldn't be looking at it for sport. So that means I'd be looking at ways to produce the most bait fish and the easiest ways to catch the fish that I wanted to eat. All right, let's see here. Um, Chuck Brinkman, got to support the fry to get big bass. That's exactly right. I didn't get this gut eating small portions. I suspect bass, <laughs> yeah, bass are the same. Bass, like the, the size of the mouth dictates what the size of food the bass want to eat. The bigger the mouth, the bigger the food they want to eat. That's why they have a big mouth. They have, don't have a big mouth because so they can yell louder than everybody else. They have a big mouth so they can eat something bigger than everybody else. All right, Dave Weber. Let's see here. Um, wait, wait, wait. Let me back up here. Lance Fredrickson, I see creeping water primrose starting in my pond. Kill it before it starts. I have nothing else, so I'm not sure. I would not kill it. Now, if it grows up 50 feet, get it before it does that. But since you have no other plants... I think creeping yellow water primrose is just fine because it's going to grow from the shore. It's going to grow out a little bit. And if your pond's fairly new, then you're not going to have anything to worry about. Dave Weber, strange you just mentioned otters. Bob, first time ever this year I had a pair show up in a six-acre pond. Get rid of them. Uh, give them, give them the, invite them to leave. Calvin says, some years back, hand caught was a popular term for largemouth bass that were sold for stocking. Was it? Is it a marketing term? Is it valid, is it, uh, valid in terms of catchability? Uh, yeah, hand caught, you know, if somebody, when I say, when you say hand caught, I presume on, on a fishing, my wife, my wife is trying to call me and she knows I do this show. So, uh, anyway, um, 
the uh, bass aggressive nature is inherited. It's a heritable trait. So yes. So let's see. I got to get going here, guys. Let me see what's going on down here. A uh, great show. Thank you. Thank you. Zach Bowens, you just showed up. Good to see you. All right. Hey, guys, listen, I'm going to wrap it up. I appreciate you watching. It's always a joy to, to see who all's on here and have a good crowd like we've had tonight. We've got 62 at the end. That's pretty darn good. And I, I thank you for that support. Don't forget about Pond Boss, pondboss.com. If you want to send me an email and answer some questions, just send an email to info at pondboss.com. I'll get it. And uh, look forward to seeing you guys next week. Not sure where I'll be. Probably right here. But uh, tune in next week, next Wednesday, 6.30 to 7.30. And until then, adios for now.